pew Bible for someone. There you go. We're in John chapter 2. <laughs> Gospel of John. All right, Joe's. What a great morning. I love when the meteorologists, the weathermen, are wrong. They said it was supposed to rain. <laughs> Amen. Okay, we're okay? All right, great. So we're, we're continuing our studies in John 2. We've been working our way through this particular chapter, and we have uh, seen how in this chapter... Uh, Jesus, after in chapter 1, John presents him as the Son of God. In chapter 2, we see him presented as the Son of Man. We see him involved in everyday activities, and we see him at a wedding feast. And, and uh, he manifests his glory in the first 11 verses. We saw that as he performed his first miracle. And then we saw in verse 12, he manifests comfort as he goes to that town and comforts the people of Capernaum. And then we saw in verses 13 through 22, the zeal that he had for, for God, uh, for obeying the written law of God. And for opposing, he had a zeal for opposing the religious traditions of men. I don't know about you, but I don't like religion. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, my experience, I grew up in religion, you know, being an Italian and growing up in Roman Catholicism. And religion, there's a lot of traditions to it and a lot of must-dos and can't-dos and this, that, and a lot of shackles. And, and Jesus opposed those things. The people that fought with him most were religious people. He, he's not into religion. Uh, he's into Scripture. And we saw his zeal for the scriptures in that uh, passage. And now before we move to the next chapter, the third chapter, there's three little verses that end chapter 2. And they're, they're very interesting in, in setting up chapter 3. And we're going to see his knowledge. Verse 23, it says this, John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. We're going to see his knowledge. We see the, the words, he knew. Jesus knew a lot. He knows a lot. One of the things we're going to see about his knowledge is his knowledge of people in general. He knows things about people what does he know? You know what he knows? He, he knows that people are attracted to the sensational. That, that's just the way we are. When something amazing or spectacular happens, you go, wow, did you get a look at, did you see that? Yeah, I mean, how often we watch TV programs and, and did you see, did you get, or the movies, did you see that? We are attracted to the sensational and the spectacular by nature. And he understands that. Now, he had just been in uh, Jerusalem. It was the first Passover that he attended since God had baptized him with the Holy Spirit and he began his ministry. He had been at the Passover before as a young man, but now at the age of 30, he's at there at the Passover feast and now God says, okay, it's time to reveal who you are, show forth your glory and begin your work. And he's performing miracles. Jesus is a miracle worker. He's got the power of God in him, and he heals people that are sick, and, and he uh, frees people from oppression, and he lifts people's spirits, and he's doing these things, and <clears throat> folks are watching it. And it says in verse 23, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. That's good. Believe is good. But you know what Jesus knew? He knew that this belief was a belief based on the miracles, and it was a profession of belief based on head knowledge of seeing miracles. And it was not enough for Jesus to commit to those people, because it says in verse 24, but Jesus did not commit to them. See, he understands that people are attracted to the sensational, but, but that's not enough for him. Why? Because it's not a matter that you believe in the sensational, or it's not enough that you've seen a miracle. What Jesus wants to get is beyond your head to your heart. And so he's looking into the heart. Why? It says he knew what was in man. He knows all the way to the innermost aspects of the heart what's going on. And you know what he knows about the heart? Remember his zeal for the scriptures? He knows what the scriptures say about the heart. You remember back in Jeremiah chapter 17? You remember that great ninth verse? <laughs> when Jeremiah is revealing some things to the people and he says this in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. And I can quote it, but if you want to turn back and read, but I will quote it for you. He says this. He says, and God's showing him. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. The heart is deceitful above all things. 
It's deceitful. Why? Our heart deceives us. Our heart can be deceived. We have been deceived. I'm talking about miracles, magicians do great works before us. And they use sleight of hand, and they use all kinds of tricks. And we can be deceived. And, and the Lord knows that hearts can be deceived, and that they are deceived by their very nature. Ever since we left uh, paradise, ever since we, the fall, and, and Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, everyone's born outside of paradise, and our hearts no longer have that innocence that they once had. Our hearts tend to be deceived. That's what gets so much mileage out of politicians. They, you know, they understand that. Uh, you look in, uh, even in the nation that we just were at war, Iraq, and look at the amount of dis deception that they pour on those people, and those people drink it up and believe it. The heart is easily deceived, and Jesus understood that thing. Another thing he knew about the heart is in Hebrews chapter 13, or chapter 3 and verse 12, it talks about we can sometimes, we often have an evil heart of unbelief. Our hearts will not believe the truth about God. We'll believe his power, we'll believe his miracle working power, but we won't believe the truth about him that he has our best interest in heart. And Jesus understood that thing. So now you look at this and you see these people, they've observed Jesus, they've watched him work, they're believing in his miracles, they're saying, hey, we believe in his name, and Jesus says, I don't commit unto them. Why? Because the sad state of many of the people in this passage here, as we're going to learn as we go through the Gospels, is they're unsaved believers unsaved believers. Oh, it sounds like a contradiction in terms. But you know what? That's probably the majority of Christianity today is unsaved believers. These are believers who are unsaved. The majority of the churches that we'll go to today, if we were to talk to the people individually and one by one, what we'd find out is they have a belief, they have a head knowledge, oh, they believe that there's one God and that's great. So do the devils and tremble. But they don't have a heart knowledge of God. And so they're head believers with an empty heart. They're unsaved believers. I was like that for 39, well, maybe not that long, probably for about 15 or 16 years, and then I walked away altogether. But I was raised in a church as an Italian, a Roman Catholic, and I believed in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, and in His Son, and, and the Apostles' Creed, and all that stuff. I had a lot of head knowledge here. I had believed as a little boy, yeah, Jesus did those miracles. I believed those things. I was an unsaved believer. Jesus had not committed to me because I hadn't committed my heart unto him. And in Protestant churches, the same thing goes on today. There are a lot of people sitting in the pews. You read testimony after testimony after testimony. I just read a testimony of a, of a young man that went to a Methodist church. And he was, he was raised by parents who were believers, and he did not have any assurance of his salvation till he was in his late teenage years, and he heard, he heard one day the preaching of Isaiah as the preacher was working up there behind the pulpit, and at that day, finally, the heart connection was made, and he became a saved believer rather than an unsaved believer. And you hear testimony after testimony like this, uh, the Mormons. The, the, the uh, what do they call it, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They talk about Jesus. They believe Jesus was here. They believe he did miracles. But they're unsaved believers. Jesus does not commit unto them. Why? Their heart won't believe the truth about Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God that died for their sins, as the Son of God. Had knowledge, no heart. No, no true, you can have a, a profession without possession and they don't possess the Lord of glory in their hearts. And Jesus knows this thing. He does not commit. He does not commit until he sees that the heart is right and willing to open. It's a sad thing. I, I see this all the time. Jehovah's Witnesses, they talk about Jesus Christ. They talk about Jehovah, but they'll talk about Jesus. And you, and you speak to them. And what are, they believe in Jesus. They believe in God. They believe all these things. But, and they've heard about the miracles, and they believe the miracles. But they, Jesus is not committed. Why? Because they won't give their heart to him. Even the Islamic people is very interesting. I was reading yesterday in um, one of the uh, websites about their beliefs, and they have many fine things to say about Jesus Christ the prophet. And they even put this little thing, PBUH, after every time his name is mentioned, peace be upon him. And he's a prophet, and they believe that he was here, and the historical Jesus. But Jesus is not committed to them. Why? Because they won't give their hearts to him. 
So Jesus understands these things, and the Bible is making it clear, and Jesus is making it clear that it takes more than believing in miracles to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, go back to what he said in Matthew 7. Go back a few books, two or three books to the left. Matthew chapter 7, before John is, is Luke, and then Mark, and then Matthew. And look what he says in Matthew chapter 7. Look at what Jesus himself says. Very interesting. He's just given a great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Many people have heard of that sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All the wonderful blessings in the Sermon on the Mount. And as he's winding it up, he realizes that this vast multitude that's listened to him, he realizes what they're going to do is they're going to take the very sermon he just put forth a spiritual meal laid out with some, some lamb over here <laughs> and some mashed potatoes here and some vegetables here and, and a little dessert with a sundae there. He just laid out a beautiful meal for them. He realizes that people are going to come up and they're going to pick smorgasbord from this meal and take what they want and walk away. And a lot of them will ignore the lamb. They're going to ignore the main portion of the meal. Of course, it's the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He realizes this. So here's how he finishes the sermon in chapter 7. I mean, it's all red, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. If you have a, a red letter Bible, it's him speaking all the way through. And in chapter 7, here's what he says in verse 21. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, oh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied on thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name we've done many wonderful works. We saw the miracles. We, we believed in the miracles. We got in on the miracle business. Verse 23, And then I, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never committed to you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's the picture that we have here in John 2. Look at the Son of Man, he has knowledge. And it's a penetrating knowledge that goes all the way through. It cuts through to the hearts of people. Go back to where we were in John. Those are, those are uh, solemn and sober warnings that ought to make us search our own hearts and wonder, are we just someone that's following Jesus because we heard about great miracles, we've heard stories, we watched something on the Discovery Channel, we heard something when we were a little kid, and we're just, uh, we believe, but we won't let him reside in our hearts? We, have we committed ourselves to Him in that He'll commit Himself to us? And by the way, He will. He will. But we've got to give Him our heart. See, let me tell you about miracles. Because a lot of people are searching after miracles. <laughs> and I understand. He knows our heart. We like the sensational. Miracles are a testimony. A testimony to God's reality and God's power. But miracles are also a test. They're not just a testimony. They're a test. And what God does is He puts that miracle before you and then He tests your own heart to reveal the condition of your heart. Can you get past the miracle and start looking inward to yourself? That's what God wants to do. See, God wants to bring us face to face with Him and face to face with ourselves. He wants to get the world and the religion out of the equation and He wants us to look in the spiritual mirror. So the, the miracle is just a way to get us to the mirror and to start to reveal what's in our own heart. So the first thing I learned about is knowledge, is he has a knowledge of people in general. But I know another thing about the, his knowledge. He has a knowledge of individuals one by one. Because it says, verse 24, he knew all men. He knew all men. They just look like crowds like a sea of faces, like a football game to us. But this is the Lord of glory. He was there at the birth of every one. He was there at the creation, putting the spirit inside the body. He knows everyone individually, as well as you know your best friend or a member of your family. That's how well he knows. He knows everyone individually. It's not just a knowledge in general about the hearts of men. It's a particular knowledge about each individual, each one in this room, each one hearing my voice. That's the Lord that we're talking about. You go through the testimonies of just this gospel alone. Back in the first chapter, Simon came to him and he knew right away. He said, Simon, I know about you. You're a willow that blows with the wind. But you're going to spend time with me. I'm going to make you into a stone. I'm going to make you solid. Nathaniel came. He says, Nathaniel, I know about you when you were under the fig tree. 
And Nathaniel realized right away, boy, this guy knows me personally. Later on, we'll see in the fourth chapter, he meets a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, and he tells her all things that ever she did in her life. And she runs and tells the people, this guy knew all about me. Later on, uh, the Jewish leaders are going to argue with him. And he says, he says to them, you know, I know something about you guys. You have not the love of God in your hearts. Right to the heart, individually. He knows all men. Uh, in the sixth chapter, he gives a great dissertation and people start arguing with him. And he turns and he says, you know, one of my 12 apostles isn't a believer. And he knows Judas individually. And then later on, when they bring him the woman caught in adultery, and here's this woman caught in the depth and depravity of sin in the very act, and yet he could see all the way through to her repentant heart, and he committed himself to her. He knows men individually. That knowledge isn't just a general knowledge. It's an individual knowledge. Now what does he do? Why did he perform the miracles? I'll tell you why. And you're going to see in chapter 3. He performs the miracles to draw us in and then to bring us to the Word. The miracles are to be used to draw us to the Word of God. The miracles cannot save. The miracles cannot solidify and confirm the relationship. It's the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so what he's going to do, he's going to bring it in. He's going to, he's going to use that miracle, and then he's going to get you in close, and then he's going to apply the Word. And you know what the Word's going to do? The Word's going to penetrate the heart. The Word's going to prick the heart. The Word's going to speak to the heart, and then the Word's going to bring conviction in the heart. And when the conviction comes, then there's only two ways you can go with that conviction. You can either receive it, and be converted, or you can reject it and be in opposition. There's no third choice when conviction comes to the heart. Those are the only two choices. You receive or reject. You become converted or you become an opposer. And that's what he's doing is he's using the miracles to, to stir these people up. He's using the miracles as a litmus test, a litmus test to see if we believe in God. Now let me tell you something. You talk about me 12 years ago, I wouldn't believe a miracle if I saw it. I was a hardened skeptic. I didn't believe there was a God. I was an atheist. If I saw a miracle, I'd have said, eh, David Copperfield, I've seen it before. I'm not impressed. It's, it's somehow they did it with smoke and mirrors. But the majority of mankind, over 90% of the people that live on this planet do believe in God. Atheists are a small minority. I was in a very small minority. I don't know if it was protected under the Minority Act. So I should check that out. But, but, but I was in a small minority. But the majority of people, they do believe in miracles. And so then what God does is he, he uses the miracle to bring you to the Word of God, to reveal our very hearts, the condition of our heart, and our need for Jesus Christ. So, so Jesus knew most of these believers. See, He knows, in general, what they're going to be like. He knows individually what the condition of the heart is, and that's the greatest knowledge that he has. Only God can look through and see the heart. He knew, you know what you know, made Jesus weep? Here he performed all these miracles. And you know what he knew? The majority of people that saw those miracles were going to be just like this person in Mark chapter 4. Turn back two books to Mark chapter 4. And this is what he realized. Jesus Christ knew this. He still knows it today. That's why he said, Broad is the way, and many there be that on it that lead to destruction. And straight and narrow is the way of life, and few find it. And he knew this was going to happen. Mark chapter 4. He says in verse 3, He says, Hearken. That means listen. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. He's speaking to common people who work the fields and he's speaking in the language of a farmer. He understands a farmer takes his seed and he goes out and he sows his seed. In verse 4, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. We see that all the time. You know, you plant your grass seed and some of the birds come and pluck it away. It's not going to grow grass. Verse 5, And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Of course, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and they choked it, and it yielded no fruit. 
And others fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundredfold. And he said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I'm not just talking about physical things. I'm trying to teach you spiritual things. And the word, and then he explains it. Look at in verse 14. The sower soweth the word. The miracle is to bring you to the Word. Now that I've got you before me, I'm going to give you the Word, Jesus says. I'm going to teach. He's going to go very next into the next chapter. And you're going to see Jesus Christ as the, the, the divine teacher. He's going to take his knowledge and share it with others, not hoard it. When I was going to medical school, I, I always thought it was a great thing because doctors, you know, they would teach us. And then my thought was to to teach others, just to be one link in a chain as the, the knowledge came down from those who had been in it longer and then to give it to those who were coming up behind me. And then one day I, I met uh, another doctor, a younger doctor uh, at the hospital and we were doing some work on the wards and he said to me, he saw me teaching and he said, why are you teaching those guys after I was done? I said, because it's just natural to, to pass the knowledge on. He said, no, no, don't teach anybody what you know. He says, keep quiet, learn what they know, then you'll know what they know plus what you know. Don't pass it on. It'll help you get ahead. And I didn't like that attitude. And Jesus doesn't have that attitude. He's going to take his knowledge and he's going to be the teacher. He's going to use the miracle to draw you close so he can begin to impart the word of God and the knowledge to you. And here's what he realized was going to happen to the majority of the people that heard. Verse 15, and these, or verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word, Immediately they receive it with gladness. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles at the feast. Did you see what that guy did? That was incredible. Verse 17, And they have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a while. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, the crowd chanted on Palm Sunday. <laughs> but afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And four days later, they said, crucify him, crucify him. They had a little head knowledge. But when the rest of the crowd said, you don't really, you're not really a born-again Christian. You don't really believe that Jesus stuff, do you? Oh, no, not me. They wouldn't commit. He doesn't commit. Stony ground hearers. That's the majority of them. He understands that. He understands that. Now, Jesus is going to use his knowledge to teach. Matter of fact, let me show you what he wants to do with knowledge. Turn to the biggest book in the Bible, Psalm. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, before we go to chapter 3, and we'll see him as the divine teacher in chapter 3. In the middle of the Bible is the book of the Psalms, in Psalm 119, and look at verse 97. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was a young man, he went to the synagogue, as it was his custom, and he read the Word of God. He had a zeal for the Scriptures, and here's how he felt about the Word of God. Uh, Psalm 97 uh, Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. That's the, the word of God. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, had made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I've always got these people that don't like me around me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. You want knowledge? See, Jesus wants to take you from the miracle to the word. That's his real desire. The miracle is just to hook you. The Word is what he really wants to sow in your heart. Too many people are looking for miracles and they're not looking for the Word of God. And God says, Jesus says, you come right here to the Word. I've got a zeal for knowledge. I want to impart knowledge. I want to teach you. So we see as he winds up the second chapter, he's leading right in as a prologue to the third chapter in John's Gospel. As a matter of fact, if your Bible has uh, paragraph markings in it, and you go back to John's Gospel, you will see that the third chapter doesn't begin with a paragraph marking. The paragraph begins back in verse 23 of the second chapter. They're connected. It's like, like those last three verses about his knowledge are just the introduction, and now he's going to demonstrate how he uses that knowledge in the third chapter. One of the key words that I saw as I went through those last three things, in, in uh, again, well, let's reread chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all, notice, men. And he need not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. 
Now, Jesus is going to speak as the divine teacher to man in chapter 3. So we move to chapter 3. Are there any questions on what we've been looking at in chapter 2 before we move on to the third chapter of the gospel that we can go over? Great, great chapter, chapter 2. But now in chapter 3, we're going to see Jesus as the divine teacher. This is, this is no ordinary teacher. This is one that's come from God. Through this chapter, you're going to watch the way he works as a teacher. It's magnificent. He's going to use illustrations so that you can understand what he's saying. Jesus always wanted to reach down and use earthly things to explain spiritual things and heavenly things. I mean, if all he did was talk on the high plane, nobody could follow him. So he would bring his teaching right down to the level, like, like what Dr. McGee said, and I think he got it when he was in school, put the cookies on the lowest shelf so the kiddies can get them. I mean, he wants to bring the teaching down. He's not going to give you some high philosophical theosophy master teachings that nobody can understand and you have to wait to ascend unto them. He's going to bring it right down so he'll use common illustrations. He's going to use illustrations in this chapter like birth. Everybody understands birth. We've all been born. He's going to, he's going to speak about the wind. We've all seen the effects of the wind. We've all felt the wind out there. He's going to talk about, then some specific things to this man, Nicodemus, about the serpent in the wilderness. And then he'll talk about, that was specific for the Jewish man, and, and we'll look at that too. He'll talk about light and darkness, something we're all familiar with. As kids, we're afraid of the dark. We like light. He's going to use those two things. So all these illustrations will be used to teach us something important. And what, what is it that the divine teacher is going to want to teach Nicodemus? Let's take a look. Let's take a look and see what happens John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That's what the Pharisees were. They were the Jewish rulers. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Rabbi was a term they used for a great teacher. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what he's going to teach about? He's going to teach about the new birth. Jesus is going to teach about the new birth. In other words, here's the divine teacher. He says, I've got one message. I've got one very important message to get across to these people. It's the message of the new birth. I've got to teach them this. This is the most important thing. You know, when you're, you're a teacher, when you have an opportunity to speak to a group of people, and you may never speak to that group of people again, you know what you want to do? You want to bring across your most important message. Why waste time on peripheral things? Let's get to the heart of the message. And the divine teacher is going to talk about the new birth right here. That's what he's going to use his knowledge to impart is the necessity of the new birth. That's the first thing he's going to talk about in verses 1 through 5 is the necessity of the new birth. Now, now again, here's, here's a man named Nicodemus. Now, who is this man? He's a ruler of the Jews. This man probably in his 50s. You couldn't get to be at that point till you were up higher. They didn't start in their 20s. They had to work their way through the Levitical priesthood and they had to do their duty for, it was 25 years, the, the Levit Levitical law said. You start at the age of 20, you apprentice for five years, you begin your duty at the age of 25, and then you finish your actual daily services in ministering in the temple at 50, and at that point you are now qualified to be a master and a ruler. And so this man's in his 50s, and he's been doing this his whole life. This is someone that maybe as a young boy decided, I want to serve God, and I want, to the, I want to go to the temple. Here's a man that had a hunger for God, this Nicodemus. Here's a man that was a good, moral man. Nicodemus was a fine man. And here's a man that had observed Jesus, someone younger than he was. By the way, it's hard to listen to someone younger teach you. I have trouble with it. I mean, it's a difficult thing to do. I mean, you figure, how can somebody younger know more than I do? You know, I mean, it, right? I mean, that kind of natural. I mean, you've, you've lived so many years, and that person's lived less years. And here he sees, who's this young guy, 30 years old? Guy's 20 years younger than I am. I haven't seen him around the temple for the last 10 years. He didn't start apprenticing with us at the age of 20. Yeah, he'd come to the services. I would see him at Passover. I remember him coming. But, uh, and, but this guy's got God's power on him. Look at what he's doing. So the miracles have hooked Nicodemus. Now Jesus is going to bring him to the Word. Nicodemus wants to learn more about Jesus. Jesus is going to teach Nicodemus more about himself. And the first thing he's going to teach him <laughs> is that he needs the new birth. 
Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. Notice, Nicodemus comes to him a, a great compliment. Again, I'm just thinking about me. Here I am, this little nobody, you know, and, and I like to teach, and, and really, I, I'm not don't have all kinds of accreditations and stuff like that. And imagine if like the president of the Southern Baptist Association, someone in his 70s, who's world-renowned, flown all over the place. As a matter of fact, I heard a, um, a message by him yesterday. I was listening on uh, one of the tapes. In the Southern Baptist Association. That's a big thing. And he was going to China to give a big uh, uh, seminar in China. And all kinds of people were there. And, and he said, and I was flying in on the plane. And I'm flying in over China. And I thought, he said, God had to help him out a little. He says, I was thinking, boy, I'm the president of the Southern Baptist Association. And he says, like a little voice said, yeah, and a billion of those people don't know who you are. And so, <laughs> it's, it's, like, God had to humble him a little bit. But, but the thing is, if he ever came and listened to me teach, and he complimented me the way that Nicodemus just complimented Jesus, I would, I'd be, I'd just, wow, man, that means a lot coming from you. That's how I'd respond. I mean, I'd say, wow, that, that's fun. I Thank you very much. I mean, that, that means a lot to me. That's not how Jesus responded. <laughs> I expect Jesus to say something like, wow, that, thank you so much, Nicodemus. A guy like you, a ruler of the Jews, someone that's way up there in the temple. You've been serving since you, you started at four years old with your, God called you, and now you've been working and working, and, and you're, you're talking to me. I've just started my ministry. I've only been at it two months now. And Jesus, Jesus knew Nicodemus needed a little more knowledge about himself. And Jesus got right to the message. He says the necessity of the new birth, number one, you need the new birth just to see God's kingdom. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't even see it, Nicodemus. In other words, Nicodemus, you're moral. Nicodemus, you're religious. Nicodemus, uh, you're a ruler of the Jews. And Nicodemus, you are spiritually blind. You can't even see the kingdom of God. That thing you're ministering to over there is not the kingdom of God. Because you need the new birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus is interested. Nicodemus is pondering. And he's thinking, he's saying, okay, now, this young man, I respect this young man. God has a message from this man, and now I want to get a hold of this. So Nicodemus questions him. And it's not a dishonest question. He's honest in verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? In other words, I need to be born again. I need, maybe I need to be reincarnated. Maybe I need to go back and, and have a second birth at this thing. Now Jesus is going to not only show the, that it's needed for, for seeing God's kingdom, but it's needed for entering God's kingdom, and he's going to explain the nature of the new birth. And then Jesus answered, verse 5, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now he's beginning to teach the nature of the new birth. And he's saying the new birth is not only necessary to see God's kingdom, but to enter into God's kingdom. And by the way, Nicodemus, I have a feeling that's the desire of your heart. Or you wouldn't be doing what you've been doing for the last 40-something plus years. And by the way, again, Jesus, speaking to hearts, is it the desire of anyone's heart listening to me to enter God's kingdom? I mean, uh, it's a good thing to desire. I mean, <laughs> for goodness sake, I mean, what do we have down here? I mean, life is short. Maybe 60 years, maybe 70 years, maybe 80 years. Eternity is long. I mean, when we leave the kingdoms of the world, what kingdom are we going to? Would we like to enter the kingdom of God? Nicodemus wanted to. So he's, he's searching out what it's going to take, and Jesus is telling him, you need to be born again. And he says, well, well then I don't get it. You mean I need to be reincarnated? In other words, I come back a second time and do things right, then I'll get it. No, no, no. He's saying you need to be born of water and born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, well, water, what does that mean? Does that, oh, maybe I need to be baptized. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Now, he's going to teach you the nature of the new birth, and here he's going to explain it in verse 6. He says, look it, let me explain it. That which is born of flesh is flesh. The water birth lines up with your first birth. It's born of the flesh. The Spirit, that which is born of the Spirit, is spirit. You need a spiritual birth. 
You need a second birth. The new birth. This is the one that's being born again. Jesus makes it very clear. This is not about baptism. Baptism is not mentioned here. Because this, this new birth he's trying to get across to him is a spiritual birth. Verse 7, so marvel not. Don't be surprised. Nicodemus must have had a look on his face like, I, 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 what's he talking about? He said, Mar don't be surprised. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Even you, Nicodemus, even you, a religious man. Nicodemus might have thought, well, gee, you know, I, I mean, good, goodness sake, I, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't steal money. I don't even work a common job. I work at the temple. I, my whole job is religion. Nicodemus would be the equivalent of a Roman Catholic cardinal. Okay? Not a priest, not a monsignor, not a bishop, but one of the cardinals that works at the Vatican. That's how high up he was in the hierarchy of religion. You know what Jesus would say to a cardinal today? Same thing, you must be born again. You know, you know who he says it to? Everybody. Why? Because you must be born again. <laughs> and said to me, you must be born again. Why? Because this birth is only your ticket to earth. That's all it's good for. It's a gift from God. God allowed every one of us to be born of the flesh. I was born of the flesh in 1954. And if I died and that's the only birth I had, I never would have seen or entered the kingdom of God. But then Jesus, using the word of God, brought me to a second birth in 1993. And that's, that's the ticket to heaven. It too is a free gift. I didn't do anything during my first birth. I don't have to do anything during my second one. And Jesus is saying it's very important. You have to have that second birth. He's going to explain in the next chapter why. He's going to say, look, God's a spirit. Flesh and blood, they can't get into the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter God's kingdom in this body. We would burn up. One of the things, we wouldn't make it. There's not enough oxygen up there as far as I know. We need oxygen for these bodies. We need a spiritual birth in order to enter that kingdom. And so he's explaining the, the nature of this birth is that it is, it's a spiritual birth. This is not something physical. Nicodemus, it's not something you have to do. You don't have to climb back in your mother's womb. You don't have to get reincarnated and do a bunch of good jobs, good acts, good deeds. You don't have to go back and forth to the temple. You don't have to give any money to God. You don't have to have any sacraments. You, it's a spiritual. This is going to be born of the Spirit. This is going to be God's work in your heart. God's going to perform the work in your heart, Nicodemus. It's a spiritual birth. That's the nature of it. Not only that, he goes on to explain to him, now he's going to use the illustration of the wind here. And, and the reason he's going to use it, let, let's take a look at verses 8 uh, through 10. See, the wind bloweth where it listeth. That means where it wants. We don't control the wind. I was out there yesterday. I live in Buffalo. I'm used to the wind coming in from the southwest direction. It usually comes like uh, from the south and off Lake Erie. We're just a tiny bit where we live in Clarence. We're just a tiny bit north of the lake. And those, the, those winds blow off the lake and they tend to blow in the south from the southwest toward us. So they're blowing toward the northeast from the southwest. Yesterday I'm out there in the yard and everything's going in the opposite direction. I'm trying to rake leaves and this doesn't make any sense to me. So I finally learned to work with the wind and I'm doing it. But I, I don't know why I was doing that yesterday. It blows where it wants. I got no control of it. I got to better learn to work with it rather than work against it. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, verse 8, but canst not tell whence it cometh. By the way, we really don't know where it comes from. I mean, it's funny, all of a sudden, like, in Chicago, there's some wind, but just this side of Chicago, there's not the... Where did it come from? I mean, I would think if it starts, it would go all the way around the world and just keep going. It just starts for a while and stops at a certain area. It just does as it... It's, this is a mysterious thing, this, uh, this wind. Well, so's the new birth. It's mysterious. It's a mysterious thing. The, the, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is everyone that's born of the Spirit." Nicodemus said, answered and said, how can, can these things be? I mean, this is a mystery to me. Folks, the new birth is a mystery to me too. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, now I'll tell you one thing. This birth right here, to be born on planet Earth, requires two things. A mommy and a daddy, okay? <laughs> two things are required. You don't get born without a mom and a dad. We're going to find that this thing requires two births. Two, two things also. It's going to require the Word, that's what He's bringing you to, and the Spirit. They're going to work together to bring forth the new birth. 
They're going to work together. The Word of God plus the Spirit of God. Now the mystery is this. If, if, if you take the Word out of the equation, you can't have the new birth. And one of the reasons so few people are born again today is not many people are teaching the Bible. They don't teach the Word of God. I went to church for a long time. Nobody stood up there and opened a Bible and taught me out of it. I learned to, to genuflect and I learned to do all kinds of things, and, 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 but I never learned the Bible. And without the Word of God, I'm missing, it's like trying to expect one of these people to bring forth a physical birth. You can't do it. But let me tell you a second thing about it for a Christian. And, and this is, we love to see people get born again. We love to see people enter into the kingdom of God. We know the future that God has for us and we know what he's willing to offer everyone else and we get excited and we go out with the word of God and we ought to do that. But you know sometimes we sit down with the word of God with someone and, and they don't get it. It takes two. Sometimes the wind isn't blowing. Sometimes the spirit's not in it. I don't know why. It bloweth where it listeth. <laughs> maybe, maybe the spirit had he tried to work with that person a few months ago and the guy had rejected. Maybe Jesus had convicted his heart and he said, no, I want nothing to do with that. Go thy way. Go, Spirit, go thy way. And the Spirit went its way. And now we're working with the Word without the Spirit. It requires both. This thing is a mystery. I mean, you know, when, when they come together. In my life it was, well, I look at this, sometimes I look at this thing and I wonder, <laughs> I said, man, it's a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle that I got born again. You're talking about a hardcore atheist. I didn't even believe in God. And yet somebody uh, started uh, bringing Bible to me. Mostly, I think you were praying for me. And you started sowing some of the seed on me, some of the Word of God. And the Spirit started to blow in my life and draw me. And then I started to examine the Scriptures myself. And then, praise the Lord, I became born again back in 1993. And I got the second birth. And I'm going to heaven. And it's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with Jesus and what He did. And it's His promises. And it's His work. And I'm so thankful for it. But man, it's, it's just amazing to me. I look at that thing. Sometimes I wonder about Calvinism. Now, no, don't get me wrong. We've taught on Calvinism. We've taken the sword of the Spirit and taken those tulips and just cut them to shred. And, and I mean, we know that Calvinism is a goofy, mixed-up theology. But I'll tell you, that wind, it bloweth where it listeth. And, uh, and he's explaining this to Nicodemus. So he's showing the nature of the new birth. It's spiritual. It, it's, it's mysterious, though, Nicodemus. But I, you know what? For Nicodemus, the wind was blowing in his life. Because he had come to Jesus. He came by night. See, he was still in darkness. But Jesus is going to reveal the light to him. So Nicodemus is on the way. And, now, and so Jesus answered him in verse 10 when Nicodemus said, How can these things be? And Jesus answered this and, and he said this. And this is just a kind of little mild rebuke. He says to him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Now, now let me just tell you something. That's, it ought not to be that way. In the Old Testament, God had said, My priests should know my law. And, and Nicodemus was at a point now where he may have been reading the Word of God a little too literally or, or physically or woodenly, but he wasn't getting the spiritual connection in there. I, the same thing could be said today to a lot of people who are in pulpits and a lot of people who are walk, wearing long black robes and red robes and whatever colors they wear. I mean, the same thing. I mean, you, you, you're a teacher of religion. You don't understand the new birth. You ought to. Jesus would say the same thing. I mean, why are you masquerading around as a religious person if you don't understand these things? I mean, these things have kind of been shown, Nicodemus. Nicodemus turned back to Isaiah chapter 38. But Nicodemus, he, he received the rebuke because you're going to find out he receives the Lord later on. He's going to get born again. We're going to see Nicodemus in heaven. But in, in Isaiah chapter 38, King Hezekiah was sick unto death. And he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord used a miracle and, and healed him and gave him 15 more years to his life. Kind of like a new birth <laughs> for 15 more years in his life. And it was a blessing to him. And, uh, and he was just so thrilled that he started to uh, praise the Lord in verse 16, in Isaiah 38, verse 16. So, Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit, so wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, uh, for, let me just see. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. And then he says in verse 19, he says, The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The living, the living, he shall praise thee. The living, watch it. 
The living, first birth. The living, second birth. Not just the living shall praise thee. One birth isn't enough. The living, the living, the living, the living. Nicodemus, don't you remember Hezekiah praying like that? You must be born again. Hezekiah had his second birth. You need, you need the new birth. You need the new birth. You're a master. You don't understand these things. Go back to John chapter three. So, so he teaches. Joe, how are we doing on time here? All right. So, so Jesus is teaching the new birth as the divine teacher. This is the most important thing that Jesus wants to teach anybody. Is is the the gift and the miracle of the new birth that God wants to give eternal life to people. And as a gift, just as He gave you your first birth, He wants to give you the new birth teaches the nature of it. And now, he's going to go on here, let me see, uh, and teach in verses 11 through 13 that this particular birth is not only spiritual, it's not only mysterious, because spiritual things are kind of mysterious to us, we're physical creatures, but it's real. It's real. It's as real as, as the chair you're sitting on. It's as real as the pulpit holding up this Bible. It's as real as your first birth. It's a real birth. Take a look in verses 11 through 13. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. I, I love that. Jesus is all of a sudden speaking in plural. What's this all about? Well, the Godhead. See, the Lord Jesus Christ had the fullness of the Godhead in him. He got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, when he speaks, you're getting the full authority of the entire Godhead speaking. We. <laughs> I mean, he's the one speaking here, but he's speaking for God the Father and the Holy Spirit. At the same time, you're getting the full impact of the Godhead speaking. I, I'm telling you these things. We're telling you these things. And, and ye receive not our witness. And that was a sad thing that so many of those people were stony ground hearers. They wouldn't receive what he said. Verse 12, now he explains, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus always spoke in parallels. Parables. He would give an earthly that would line up perfectly with a heavenly. I mean, it, it, it's such a blessing. He was not, again, like those Eastern masters <laughs> that teach all these, these spiritual things that nobody can get a hold of. He teaches about farmers sowing seed, fishers fishing for men. He teaches on an earthly level, but it lines up perfectly with the spiritual. He just taught about the physical birth, lines it up with the spiritual birth. He's talking about the wind down here, talking about how that's like the spirit. He's going to line things up. I'm going to tell you of earthly things and line it up to heavenly things. What a great teacher he is. Verse 13, and he says, Nicodemus, let me explain this to you. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That's an amazing verse. But what he's saying is, look at Nicodemus, you know a lot of people think they're going to ascend to heaven based on what they've done for God. A lot of people think they're going to get to to heaven based on the good life that they've lived. He says, Nicodemus, you've been studying the written word of God. I know you're a teacher in Israel and you've been reading the works of Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and you've read about all those prophets and you're probably thinking all those guys have ascended to heaven. He says, no man hath ascended to heaven. But that's the only one that has the ability to ascend to heaven and take someone with him is the Son of Man. I had to descend first before I could ascend. He's trying to teach Nicodemus the necessity. It's not anything you can do in the flesh in your first birth on here on earth that's going to make you worthy to ascend into heaven. It's going to be the work of the second birth from the one that came down from heaven that's going to teach you and show you and give you new life in the second birth. It's the Son of Man that's going to do these things for you. It's a real birth, Nicodemus. It's a real birth. And what, what I'm going to do for you, Nicodemus, I'm going to do something that nobody else could do. I'm going to forgive all your sins. See, think about a real birth. When a baby is first born, have you ever seen the policeman come and arrest the baby and carry them off to jail? Why? Well, there's no prior offenses. There's nothing that the baby's ever done wrong. So is the new birth. When you got the new birth, all history of offenses are wiped out. There's no spiritual police coming to take you off to hell. It's all forgiven and forgotten. The new birth is a real thing. It's going to allow you to ascend into heaven. You're going to be a new child of God. 
You're going to his kingdom. You're going to enter and see the kingdom of God because of this thing. So he teaches the necessity and the nature of the new birth. Now next week, we're going to look at the basis for the new birth and then the confusion about the new birth. Because man, it's a confusing thing to a lot of people. I still get confused about it sometimes. I'm just thankful that it's so simple that if you'll just open your heart and trust Jesus for who he is, God's son and the redeemer, you can get the new birth. I got it in 1993. I've been born twice, so I can only die once. Only my body dies. My soul goes right to heaven. What a deal. That's the gift of the new birth. Any questions on what we've been looking at today? Let's pray and thank God. Uh, Father, we thank you that your son was such a great teacher. And he makes these things that are mysterious and spiritual, he makes them plain and clear by using illustrations. Now, Lord, seed has been sown. I pray that, I pray that it will I implant in people's hearts, Lord and help it to bring forth good fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. I offer this prayer up in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.